Remembering Dr. Gary A. Flint, author of A Theory and Treatment of Your Personality, A Manual for Change. In this book, he describes the process healing method, or PHM, and it is a technique that is best defined as a waking state hypnotic treatment method based on a memory model. The process healing method is a treatment intervention for a wide variety of mental health issues. The process healing method works from a memory model to allow systematic treatment of pain, negative beliefs, difficult memories, and addictions without the client re-experiencing traumatic events. With some people, the use of the process healing method almost exclusively, and with others, it is used in combination with other treatment approaches. This approach does not require a person to consciously know all the pieces of information related to their symptoms in order to treat the issue. The person simply needs to be clear about wanting the issue treated. Because the subconscious mind has access to conscious and unconscious information, we'll be able to problem solve healthy solutions with a wealth of information. Now, please enjoy this five part summary from Dr. Gary Flint, part one response and reinforcement. Part two, stimulus response reinforcement. Part three, personality parts. Part four, the subconscious. Part five, the basic treatment. These summaries go over the first three chapters of the book, A Theory and Treatment of Your Personality, A Manual for Change, which I highly recommend getting your own copy of the book. In part one, I will discuss response and reinforcement, which are two building blocks of the learning theory of the personality. I'm starting slowly because most people don't know about learning theory. I introduce the idea of memory structures, which are metaphors for neural networks. The physiology of a response and its motivation associates with the memory structure. Part two discusses stimulus, response, and reinforcement, and further develops the use of memory structures. I finished part two by presenting the rationale for basic constructs used in the model. I modified some behavior concepts to fit with clinical experience. Some of these modifications are not consistent with an academic view of learning theory. Everything we feel, think, and do are a series of responses evoked or stimulated from memories in our brain. All responses have a unique memory structure. I use memory structure to describe all responses because it simplifies the complexity of our brain. I define a memory structure as a neural network or a complexion of neural networks. The neural networks or physiology associated with a memory structure can cause a response and provide motivation for the response. There are several sources for motivation, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and generalized reinforcement. The effect of reinforcement for a response amasses in the memory structure. This is a Skinner box. I'm going to show you the relationship between response and reinforcement by using a rat's behavior in a Skinner box. In our example, a hungry rat put in the box, eventually presses the bar or lever sticking out of the wall. A food pellet drops into the box in the wall. The rat gets the food pellet, which reinforces the preceding bar press response. The vertical line measures the rate of the bar press responses per minute. The horizontal line is a measure of passing time. A food pellet reinforces the response after each bar press response. A hungry, untrained rat put in the Skinner box, starts responding at a slow rate of response. As the effects of reinforcement increases the motivation of the response, the bar press response increases to a high rate. 
Here we see the memory structure of the bar press response and the amassed positive reinforcement. The physiology causing the bar press associates with the memory structure. The reinforcement, the decrease of food deprivation, builds in some way on the memory structure to provide motivation for the response. Stopping the food reinforcement causes extinction of the response. The line on the right of the figure shows the rat is still motivated to respond at a high rate. Frustrated, the rat responds at, at an even higher rate of response for a while. Then as the motivation gradually changes on the memory structure, the response rate decreases to a low rate of response. I believe that it is the neutral feeling of the Skinner box without food that associates with the memory structure, thereby replacing the effects of food reinforcement. The memory structure after extinction still has the physiology for the bar press, but there is no motivation for the rat to press the bar. The frequency of the occurrence of the bar press response is low. How do we know the physiology for the bar press response is still there? When we make food reinforcement available again, giving a food pellet for every bar press, the rat rapidly increases its rate of response to a high rate. This is called spontaneous recovery. Extinction did not erase the response because the response rate increased more rapidly than in the first session. This suggests that there was an existing memory structure for the bar breath. Reinforcing the response after extinction changed the memory structure. It now has both the response and the motivation for the response. The reinforcement of the response reestablishes the motivation for the response on the memory structure. Let's review motivation. Positive reinforcement is any response that causes a decrease of the basic need for food, water, shelter, clothing, or positive social contact. We carry dog treats to reinforce our dog's good behavior. Negative reinforcement occurs when the removal of a threat or painful experience follows the response. Here is an example. A naive rat is put in the Skinner box and given a small continuous shock. The rat presses the bar and the shock goes off for 20 seconds. The offset of the shock reinforces the bar press. Money is the best example of a generalized reinforcer. Money has previously been associated with positive and negative reinforcement. Punishment occurs when the targeted response causes a painful outcome. The response no longer occurs and appears suppressed. Jail time following a crime suppresses the criminal response. The shaping of behavior occurs when you reinforce responses similar to the goal behavior until achieving the goal behavior. This shows that a response associated with the memory structure is not fixed but can be changed. Here are some examples. When all students agree to attend to the teacher when he approaches the corner of the room, in time the teacher will lecture from the corner of the room. Another example is when you put a naive rat into the Skinner box. The rat gradually starts pressing the bar at a higher rate. This is the shaping of the bar press response. Dissociation is a process that makes active conscious memories unconscious. A dissociated active response is not conscious, but is an active response in the unconscious. Dissociation is an active process that associates with a conscious response to make it unconscious. I believe that dissociation is a developmental process learned to move irrelevant or unuseful conscious memories to the unconscious. Here is an example. When you drive 20 minutes and don't remember driving the car, the active driving behaviors were unconscious. Your conscious mind attended to something else. Here's another example. A skilled high jumper works hours to learn the fine points of making the jump. When he jumps in competition, he's not thinking of the fine points. He is doing them and they are working in the unconscious. Dissociation is a natural process that we use daily in our lives. We're starting to get ready to build a model of the personality. These ellipses are constructs that are convenient to represent the unconscious and conscious active memories. They make it easier to think about unconscious and conscious active memories. Here we are putting the active memories in the two ellipses together in one ellipse. I call this the active experience 
because this construct represents all active memories. To remove confusion, I put the dissociation process down the middle as a supposed barrier between active unconscious and conscious memories. Don't forget dormant memories. We have been behaving from shortly before birth until now. We have millions of unique memories that have recorded our experience and our behavior. Dormant memories are not active and not involved in creating behavior. It is an important idea used in therapy. Here we are. What is behavior? Behavior is a sequence of memory structures that, when activated, create responses that cause the behavior. All responses have unique memory structures. Responses are created in the active experience from active conscious and unconscious memories. A collage forms to make the response that will give the person more happiness and less pain. Note that all people and personality parts want more happiness and less pain. This is a useful truism in therapy. It is important to watch the slideshows in the correct sequence. Each slideshow prepares the viewer for the following shows. Please continue to part two to learn about stimulus response and reinforcement. Basic learning theory concepts, the basis for the personality model used with the process healing treatment method. I assume that you have completed part one. Part two builds on the information presented in part one. In this part, we continue to build the model discussing stimulus response and reinforcement. Recall that behavior is a sequence of memory structures that, when activated, creates the behavior. All responses have unique memory structures. Active conscious and unconscious memories in the active experience are used to create a response. A collage is formed to make a response that will give the person more happiness and less pain. Memories move back and forth between the dormant and active memories as stimulation changes. What is a stimulus? A stimulus is a sensory event such as an image, sound, or feeling that activates a memory structure into the active experience. Each memory structure has a representation of the stimulus event. Hearing cat, pet, or jack evokes the memory of the cat. The more motivation, the more likely the memory will activate. Stimuli evoke responses into the active experience. Using the verb evoked implies that the likelihood of activating the response is variable depending upon motivation. External and internal stimuli evoke responses. The memory structure of a response includes the stimuli that will evoke it. Internal stimuli such as muscle sensations, organ activity, the bladder, skin sensations, and itch. Hunger, thirst, and general aches and pains can evoke or trigger dormant memories. Unstimulated dormant memories remain dormant. Again, stimuli are represented in the memory structure. When a stimulus occurs, the memory structure is activated. Unstimulated active memories become dormant. External stimuli. Our sensory experiences are external stimuli that evoke dormant memories into the active experience. External stimuli are hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, and tasting. Memory structures or responses that have the specific external sensory experience associated with them will activate. Again, active memories, not stimulated, become dormant. Emotions of active memories can activate dormant memories with similar emotions. Emotions in the memory structures of the dormant memories are similar to the active emotions in the active experience. Unstimulated responses remain dormant. Responses can provide stimuli. How is that? A memory structure has physiology representing many features of the response. These features of the response can serve as stimuli to evoke other responses into the active experience. Responding to a girl with different qualities will evoke memories and thoughts about that girl and other girls. Let's look at stimuli and the active experience. Both active internal and external stimuli and active responses and emotions serve to evoke dormant memories or responses with similar qualities into the active experience. Other unstimulated active responses become dormant. How are we protected from response overload? Just like the dissociative process, 
there is another developmental process that serves as a gatekeeper for admitting responses into the active experience. This is the associative process. The red line around the active experience represents this. Normally, when we see a pencil, we don't think of a hot dog or a nail, although they have similar stimuli. The associative process prevents it. When a person's dissociative and associative processes are not working together, they have difficulty focusing. People with damaged associative processes can have personality disorders like loose associations. Why are stimuli important? Stimuli trigger trauma or painful emotions. Treatment only occurs in the active experience with active memories. Therapists create strategies or interventions to trigger or activate the memory of the target issue. Here are some examples. When you say a statement opposite to the target belief, it triggers all memories associated with the target belief. Or think of the trauma that's bothering you. The trauma will activate in your conscious or unconscious mind. When you see your abuser, you can have traumatic intrusions activate in your conscious or unconscious mind. The autobiographical memory consists of all memories that were learned after we developed our sensory experiences. It runs from shortly before birth till now. It is a record of our experience. The behavior of the main personality is obtained from the autobiographical memory. Initially, I believed that there was a basic neural structure that constructed a collage from the active experience to create a response. Now I believe that the creation process is caused by a property of the universe that maintains continuity between living and inert objects. While this assumption is not important for this model of the personality, it is important in my theory of spiritual reality. Examples of triggering a response. When were you born? What is your birth date? What was the last school you attended? What catches your eye when you're in the mall? Do you remember a big toilet accident? These questions triggered dormant responses or answers from your autobiographical memory into our conscious main personality. What did you learn? You learned about dormant memories, the active experience, and that memories move back and forth between dormant and active memories. You also learned that a response is a collage assembled in the active experience, and that the main personality is created from the autobiographical memory. You learn what stimulates memories, and that stimuli are important in therapy. You learn about the basic neural structure and about dissociative and associative processes. This is the end of part two. In this part, you learn about stimulus, response, and reinforcement. If you've understood everything, Go on to part three. Otherwise, replay part two to pick up what you may have missed. Part three presents a model to describe the creation of traumatic personality parts. While not consistent with current psychological thinking, most of the patients with whom I have worked over the past 15 years easily accepted the model. See you in part three. This is part three of basic learning theory concepts, the basis for the process healing treatment method. I assume you have watched parts one and two. These parts mainly taught you the words or constructs used in the learning theory model. Part three introduces the mechanics of creating personality parts. Although few professionals accept this view of the personality, people and their parts readily accept the metaphors and constructs used in the model that are useful in composing interventions and treatment. This is where it gets interesting. Recall you learned about dormant memories, active experience, what stimulates memories, that a response is a collage of active memories, and about dissociative and associative processes. This figure shows the most basic parts of the personality model. Active stimuli, responses, and emotions all activate dormant memories into the active experience. Unstimulated active memories return to dormancy. A collage built on the last response, the recurrent process creates and causes the next response. The associative process screens for fitting responses to activate in the active experience. The dissociative process associates with unuseful active memories in the conscious experience to make them unconscious. At this point, we can assume that a massive basic neural structure is instrumental in creating the responses. Let's start talking about trauma. 
A simple trauma is a trauma in which you do not lose consciousness. A slip on the ice, a broken arm, a trip to the hospital are traumas you can share with someone when you reach home. Simple traumas involve moderate pain. You know how to deal with the trauma event. Recall the autobiographical memory. This consists of memory structures that amass from a little before birth to now. The main personality is created from memories in the autobiographical memory. With no severe traumas, the main personality is a straight line showing that there are no compartmentalized parts. The person can remember experiences from early in life. You can recall dissociative memories if you present the right stimuli or use simple therapy interventions. Severe trauma occurs when a person experiences an intense emotional or painful trauma. Sometimes when this happens, there is a blank spot in his or her autobiographical memory or main personality. In this blank spot, a person has amnesia for whatever happened. These amnesic memories are difficult to access. Amnesia has been a problem for psychology for over a century. Extreme trauma creates personality parts. For years, psychologists called personality parts dissociative parts. This confused thinking about normal dissociation, which causes amnesia, and personality parts, which also cause amnesia. I believe that parts created in extreme trauma causes amnesia by having an autobiographical memory that is different from the main personality's autobiographical memory. The stimuli in a severe trauma are not familiar to the main personality's memory structure, so it becomes amnesic during the trauma. After the trauma, the main personality cannot access the amnesic part, which is compartmentalized from the main personality. Personality parts are properly called compartmentalized parts. Let's look at the characteristics of personality parts. Personality parts can run the body, therefore have executive function. Executive function is a capacity of using working memory, reasoning, problem solving, as well as planning and carrying out daily tasks. They amass an autobiographical memory at the time that they are running the body. They usually have dissociated memories. They can sometimes be aware of other parts and the main personality. They are normal with learned behaviors to handle the extreme trauma situation. Let's look at severe trauma. A severe trauma occurs when you have, one, no memory in the main personality to handle the situation, and two, the pain and emotions are high. With extreme pain, the brain mobilizes and activates all related emotions and pain memories. Because this is not included in the structure of the main personality's autobiographical memory, rapid mobilization causes the personality to become dormant. A part is formed as time passes. The part amasses an autobiographical memory of the trauma experience. When the pain is low enough, the main personality becomes active again, and the trauma part becomes dormant. With no memories to handle the trauma and with intense emotions, at one, the trauma starts and the brain mobilizes, flooding the active experience with intense emotions and relevant behaviors. The autobiographical memory had no memory record of the situation causing the trauma and becomes dormant. At two, the stimulus complexion changes and mobilizing behavior and emotions flood the active experience, forcing the autobiographical memory and main personality to go dormant. A new personality part is formed to run the body and a new personalized autobiographical memory amasses during the trauma. At three, when the situation becomes familiar to the main personality, MP, it rapidly returns to the active experience. With the return of the main personality, the trauma part, TP, with its autobiographical memory, becomes dormant at four. Just as dissociation occurs in the main personality, a compartmentalized part can dissociate similar behavior in his or her experience. Although the experience of a part is different than that of the main personality, the same source in the autobiographical memory generates many of his or her behaviors. Examples of this are driving a car, language, keeping appointments, or knowing her child's school schedule. A compartmentalized part can dissociate painful information in his or her experience. 
This shows that there are two processes causing amnesia, one caused by the dissociation process and the other caused by creating compartmentalized parts. The first is a learned and shared process, and the other is an extreme trauma causing a structural creation. Let's look at personality or compartmentalized parts. The main personality works as a compartmentalized part. Some parts can watch other parts without being seen. Sometimes they are unaware of each other. Parts can learn new languages that are unknown by the main personality or other parts. The autobiographical memories of parts can be private or completely or partially shared. Some parts are fragile because they took all the torture and pain of their childhood. Some parts protect the main personality or person in his or her daily activities. What does therapy with parts look like? While some parts believe they want more pain and less happiness, I have found that all parts want more happiness and less pain. This is my primary leverage for getting parts to cooperate. I view all parts as normal and treat them with respect, even the most dangerous parts. Some parts have considerations about joining what I call the treatment team or getting treatment. These considerations serve as barriers for treatment but can be easily removed by reframing namely by explaining away the barrier. Since this model fits all personalities, therapists use problem solving to adjust the model to each unique personality. Experience can stretch the personality in many directions. The use of problem solving adapts the model to each patient. The therapist does this. This is the end of part three, in which we talked about simple and extreme trauma creating compartmentalized parts, their characteristics, and some problems that may arise when treating them. In part four, I will describe how I learned about the subconscious and began to incorporate the capabilities of the subconscious into my treatment activities. You will learn how the subconscious can be an ally in treatment and greatly speed up therapy while giving complete respect to the patient. Thank you for watching this. This is part four of Basic Learning Theory Concepts which are the basis for the process healing treatment method. In this part, I'm going to give you a description of my discoveries made about the subconscious. It felt like I was being led to gain a better understanding of the subconscious and what its capabilities were. I learned from many patients whose subconsciouses taught me what I needed to know. The subconscious is the most significant aspect of the process healing method. In part three, you learned about the main personality, the autobiographical memory, and creating compartmentalized parts. You also learned about the dormant memory and the active experience. Treatment involves dormant memories and the active experience. Most treatment interventions target problematic beliefs, memories, and parts without knowing where the treatment takes place. The subconscious is the last key to the process sealing method. Here I explain how the subconscious developed. The subconscious is a part of us that started at conception. Trauma and later experience did not affect it. See the dashed line in the figure. As sensory experience started, other memory structures formed from which the subconscious was independent. The subconscious can observe the activities and the active experience without being affected by its content. How did I meet the subconscious? I was a hypnotherapist and learned to give indirect hypnotic suggestions to the subconscious or some inner self helper. I had extensive training in neurolinguistic programming, NLP, from which I learned additional techniques to use the inner resources of a person. You can assume for the moment that there is a subconscious and that this video will teach you its capabilities. You might have contact with your subconscious by the end of this video. Some people can quiet their mind and ask, can I talk to my subconscious? And they hear a yes. I found the subconscious could be my ally. I had a patient who experienced torture. Her main personality became dormant at the age of eight. A nine-year-old part of her ran the body for years and learned to be a nurse's aide. She had many normal and programmed parts. I worked through them by treating them with EMDR, eye movements, to remove the pain from the trauma part and integrate them. The subconscious helped me by flopping her arms straight up in the air 
when treatment of the part was complete, I concluded that the subconscious could actively help the therapist when treating a patient. Here's how I learned the subconscious could help me improve my treatment interventions. This patient had an inner blackboard on which the subconscious wrote messages, simple answers to my questions. I was using EMDR, eye movements, to treat many traumatic memories. At one point, he said, I don't believe this. The subconscious said to use a silver pen with a gold tip on it to do the EMDR and to move the pen randomly in and out to treat my traumas. I had a silver pen with a gold tip in my desk. For six weeks, I treated this long list of traumatic memories. I concluded that the subconscious could help me improve my treatment interventions. The subconscious can treat from the inside. Here's how it was revealed to me. I had just learned how to diagnose for thought field therapy. In this therapy, you could diagnose the sequence of acupressure points to tap on to treat a target issue. While we were talking, she felt a tickle under her nose. I asked her subconscious if she was doing this. With a yes, made with a finger response, the patient tapped on the tickle spot. Then she started getting itchy points all over her body. I asked the subconscious if she should tap on them. Yes. Soon the itchy spots were coming too fast. I asked the subconscious if she could do the tapping on the inside. Yes, the issue was treated. From this, I concluded that the subconscious could do treatment interventions of painful memories. I initially taught the subconscious to treat with EFT, demonstrating the treatment method to the patient and the subconscious. Later, while in a park, a friend had a nasty part take over his body. I created a metaphor to teach the subconscious a treatment method, and he treated the part. Here's how I did it. I was sitting next to a soccer field and told the subconscious to imagine gopher holes, mounds of dirt, appearing in the soccer field when the part activated. He could take a feather and smooth out the gopher holes, thereby treating the part. It has worked for 20 years. I was working with a patient who had many parts put in by systematic torture. Every week, I asked her subconscious if she finished treating all the parts. She always said yes. For a year, I asked this question, and in the following session, I found other active parts to treat. I concluded that the subconscious could only see and treat active memories. The subconscious cannot see dormant memories. The finding that the subconscious could help me improve my treatment skills excited me. I was working with the subconscious of a torture survivor and asked the subconscious if she could enter the body and talk to me. She could. I talked with her and asked many questions about the structure of the personality and about her programming. Prior to the session, she could use features of problem memories to trigger the experiences causing them. After the session, I discovered that she was not as perceptive of memories in the active experience. What could I do about this? I decided that I would try to use EMDR with the subconscious. I had her look out her eyes while I did the intervention. I found that this worked to remove emotions she acquired when she was active in the body. She was again able to perceive in the active experience. She could use features of the problem memories to trigger the experience that caused them. Years later, I had a patient whose previous therapist had talked with her subconscious. Again, I used EMDR to treat the subconscious and successfully remove the barriers to her perception. Here is what I concluded about the subconscious. One, the subconscious can only treat active memories and cannot see dormant memories. He or she could, however, use features of the problem issue to trigger the dormant trauma that caused them. Two, the subconscious can serve as a treatment ally when problem solving. Three, the subconscious can improve treatment strategies. Four, the subconscious can learn treatment interventions. Patients experience each of the interventions, EFT, TAT, and EMDR, differently when they are in progress. And five, with problem solving, I usually contact the subconscious in the initial 90 minute session. As hard as it may be for some viewers to accept, the subconscious does all the treatment in this healing method. The advantage of this is that the treatment is well-planned, safe, painless to the patient, and most importantly, 
It is a process the patient owns. The patient can use it to treat small issues and, with some patients, to treat compartmentalized parts. Therefore, it fully empowers the patient in his or her treatment. When the patient feels the active processing in their brain and notices the pain of a sample issue gradually decreasing the ho-hum, the result sells the patient on the treatment method. This is the end of part four. It is important for you to understand fully the power of the subconscious. By working with the subconscious, most traumatic issues are treated safely, without pain, and rapidly, as you will see. When problem solving and trying novel interventions, the subconscious can access whether it is safe to treat or use the intervention. Now we move on to part five. This video introduces you to the basic treatment approach usually used when treating any issue. In this video, I'm going to explain the treatment process. Then communication with parts and the basic treatment plan are presented. After a review of the treatment method, I explain how the subconscious treats the trauma over the duration of the trauma. The pain intensity treated and a pause between treatments are two variables used in the treatment plan for each part. I explain the integration of parts and the safeguards of treating fragile parts. I describe how to contact the subconscious and to problem solve to deal with barriers for communication with treatment. This is all described in Chapter 3 of A Theory and Treatment of Your Personality, which you can download from www.garyaflint.com, my blog site. The advantages for the main personality getting treatment are that he or she will get more happiness and have less pain. The main personality will also no longer experience intrusions, have any lost time, or dissociate important information. All the parts can run the body from morning to night with no conflict. In addition, studies show that fully integrated people having a mono personality are more successful in life. In this treatment, I educate all parts so that they know what is happening and agree to common goals. The subconscious will do the treatment, but the treatment method will not be taught to the subconscious until all members of the treatment team agree. Recall that we amass an autobiographical memory. Traumas at different times can cause personality parts. The main personality can be amnesic of these parts. In this section, you will learn about the subconscious treating and integrating the personality parts. When I communicate with parts, I explain that I want them to join a treatment team that will give me permission to teach the subconscious how to treat pain. I remind them that we all want more happiness and less pain. Treatment is a painless process. I don't need to hear their trauma history, but will listen if they want to share. Members of the treatment team want treatment, want to have their positive self-empowering behaviors strengthened with positive emotions, and want to integrate with the main personality. They agree to work in consensus when setting treatment parameters for each part on the treatment team. This is an educational process to convince the parts to join the treatment team. The subconscious treats the pain a little bit at a time. I offer more safeguards so the parts do not flood the main personality or feel pain. After integration, they can run the body full time with no conflict and get more happiness and less pain. The subconscious orchestrates the trauma part to put a safe amount of pain into the active experience. The rest of the pain stays outside of the associative barrier. The subconscious treats the pain in the active experience carefully. The subconscious treats a safe intensity of pain across the duration of the trauma. The intensity of pain treated is held constant. The time for the pain is adjusted to hold the intensity of the pain constant. As trauma pain, intensity changes over time, say from high to low. The rate of treatment is a fixed unit of pain treated each time, see the figure. The treatment team and the subconscious create treatment plans for each part on the team. All treatment team members have to agree on each treatment plan consisting of the unit of pain and the rest time. Each plan has its own rate of treatment. When the stimulation of parts reaches a certain threshold, 
They will flood the act of experience. To prevent flooding, the subconscious treats them to a safe point and then rest. The rest time is a treatment parameter. The subconscious treats the part's pain before integration. Its positive self-empowering behaviors have been strengthened with positive emotions. With integration, it joins the main personality in a union of memories by sharing memories back and forth until the part and main personality have identical memories. This usually strengthens positive behaviors and weakens negative behaviors. A memory of the part fills in the amnesic space in the main personality's history. Dissociative memories of both remain dissociated. If the part thinks its trauma will hurt the main personality, the subconscious can dissociate the trauma memory of the part during the treatment. When the subconscious integrates the part and the main personality, I believe they share their memories back and forth. The other integrated parts also share, so all parts have identical memories. After integration, they can all run the body at the same time without conflict. Some parts are afraid they will experience too much pain or flood the main personality. To prevent this, I ask the subconscious to move four parts somewhere in the brain and cluster them together. The space in the center protects active treatment from other brain activities or stimulation that may trigger the part to flood the active experience. The space between the parts is a protected space in the brain to treat the fragile parts. The size of protected space for treatment, I have more interventions that ensure safety while treating. One, I ask the subconscious to treat the associative and dissociative processes at the same time. Extreme trauma often damages these processes. This also gives the subconscious better control of the pain treated. Two, I ask the part to back into the active experience. This reduces or cancels anticipatory anxiety. Three, I ask the part to wear a boa, leotards, or a diving suit to hold them together so they won't fall apart. Four, I ask them to hold the hand of the creator or a significant other to give them security. At this point, I tell the parts that I won't teach the treatment method until all parts are on the treatment team and agree to it. I communicate with the subconscious using finger responses. Index fingers means yes, thumb means no, middle finger means I don't want to tell you, and the little finger means I don't know. I ask, can I talk to your subconscious? Sometimes I get a yes, and sometimes I get a no or no response. When I get a no or no response, either now or during treatment interventions, I problem solve. I ask, can I talk to the part who's blocking communication? With either a yes or a no, I ask, is there a consideration blocking you from speaking with me? With either a yes or a no, I ask questions about common barriers. Here are some examples. Are you afraid the pain will be too great? Are you afraid that you will die? Do you fear of losing your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of life? Is there a pre-birth part interfering with communication? Do you want more pain and less satisfaction? All 17 reframes are given for 17 different barriers in chapter three, pages 75 to 87. When you believe that all parts are on the treatment team, ask, do all the parts on the treatment team want the subconscious to learn the treatment method? With a no, you continue problem solving to get all the parts on the treatment team. When you get a yes, you use an oncology check from NLP to make sure. You ask, do you mean that there are no parts that don't have any objections to my teaching the subconscious the treatment method? This question confuses personality parts and they answered no. When this happens, you problem solve and treat the parts until you get a yes. In my experience, the subconscious gives a yes when all the parts are on the treatment team and want the subconscious talk the treatment method. Once all the parts are on the treatment team and the subconscious is taught the treatment metaphor, I ask the subconscious and the treatment team to create treatment plans for all members of the treatment team. They all vote in consensus, which means that all parts have to agree on the treatment plan for each part. This protects the wee baby part from being afraid when the subconscious treats a part with extreme pain. 
Once the treatment plans are completed, I ask the subconscious to treat the parse in the best order and in the best way. The patient usually feels the process start with a sensation occurring somewhere in the brain. In this video, I presented the steps one has to take to convince all parse to join a treatment team. Then after an ecology check, I teach the subconscious the treatment method. The problem solving interventions shown in this process are used constantly in treatment. As with EMDR and EFT, one intervention fits all people. The same is true of this treatment method. I use these interventions with all people, but further treatment needs problem solving to customize the interventions for the person. All people have unique autobiographical histories. The memory structures of traumas created can be unusual and need creative problem solving. I am still planning part six in this series. You can download this material presented in chapter three from either my blog site at www.garyaflint.com or from www.neosolteric.com. Thank you for watching.